five opioids and uh, benzodiazepines in older adults. Uh, really interesting topic. Uh, and she also completed is completing a two-year fellowship in the Carolina postdoctoral program for faculty diversity. So without further ado, uh, it's my great pleasure to hand it over to uh, Kate and Tamara, uh, Dr. Egan and Dr. Hughes uh, for this webinar, Partnering with Your Neighborhood Pharmacist to Prevent Opioid Use Harms. Uh, Kate, please take it away. As I turn off my camera. Mark, thank you very much for that introduction and thank you everyone for joining us today, the day after Labor Day. Um, so we are excited to talk with you about working with uh, local pharmacists and if we have pharmacists on the call, how pharmacists can work with communities. Uh, so I have up here our learning objectives. Um, for the day, so we're going to talk about different strategies that can be implemented by neighborhood pharmacies to prevent opioid use harms. We're going to talk about building partnerships with community pharmacies, how to integrate opioid prevention strategies within pharmacies through partnerships, and then very briefly assessing community member barriers and facilitators to assessing these services. So these are the um, main topics that we'll walk through today. This is the agenda. So we're not going to spend time giving you statistics about uh, the opioid crisis. If you're here, I am sure that you are uh, more than aware of what, what that looks like in your community. Um, one thing to note is that there are some slides uh, that are designed for that Southeast um, prevention group, uh, but even though we give you an overview, everything that we share can be implemented uh, across different states. So we do provide those resources. Uh, Tamara is going to go over the pharmacist practice rules in the opioid crisis, um, specifically looking at naloxone, dispensing medications for opioid use disorder. Won't really spend a lot of time on safer dispensing. We'll talk a little bit more about medication storage and disposal. Then I'm going to take over and talk about how we can partner with your community pharmacist, giving some more um, discrete examples, using CADCA 7 strategies, because when you need to write your grants um, and proposal applications for funding, often you're going to be asked to tie in your strategies, um, your explicit opioid strategies, into these seven strategies with CADCA. So hopefully that, that's helpful to think about how you as a community substance use provider um, can use those CADCA 7 strategies. So the one bit of context that we are going to provide in regards to the opioid crisis um, is just to talk through the opioid overdose reduction continu continuum of care approach. And this really relays onto kind of those broad topics and strategies that pharmacists can do in their communities. So this diagram, it's very busy. Um, I'll orient it to it. Um, we really appreciated all that it brought to the table. Um, so this diagram came out of the Healing Community Study, um, and it's regarding opioid overdose reduction. And at the top, you'll see we have primary prevention, secondary prevention, and tertiary prevention. So thinking about your different funding strategies, um, that you might go after. You might be in a silo within primary prevention, or you might be able to uh, work into tertiary prevention, um, especially if we're thinking about that opioid funding that's coming to communities. And so we're thinking about different individuals within the opioid use spectrum. So from not using opioids um, all the way to sustaining recovery. And there are three large buckets of opioid strategies that the healing community study are focusing on. Um, the first is overdose education and naloxone delivery. Um, so this is really getting at both active and passive education. So that active education is more targeting at-risk individuals um, and at high-risk uh, venues. The passive element is really where we're gonna start thinking about where the pharmacy can come into play. Uh, so by referral and self-request, uh, so as an individual who um, might be at risk or have a family member at risk, they can uh, request for naloxone and training from a pharmacist. Tamara will get into 
that more. Um, and then naloxone ad administration from the first responder. The next piece is this effective delivery of medications for opioid use disorder. So there's a big push to expand the treatment availability across multiple settings. The linkage of services um, from opioid treatment centers uh, to pharmacies, thinking about um, the justice community. So we have treatment engagement and retention. So how, how do we engage and retain people um, who are actively in treatment? And so there are really um, big roles here for the pharmacist. Then we have safer opioid prescribing and dispensing. Um, so the HEAL part requires the um, safe prescribing practices, which the pharmacist dispenses, remember, and doesn't prescribe. Um, but I've worked with pharmacists who's also, who have also coordinated with prescribers um, if they've noticed perhaps that a prescriber is um, no longer following guidance that has been provided by the CDC. Um, and so pharmacists are involved um, in shaping prescribing practices in that sense very much involved in dispensing practices, um, and there are ways in which pharmacists can incorporate medication disposal on site. So this is the approach that we're using um, for our talk today. And with that, I will turn that over to Tamara. Tamara, just let me know when you want me to advance the slide. Okay, I will. Thank, thank you, Kate. Um, so now I'm gonna talk about pharmacist practice roles in the opioid crisis. Um, before we begin, I wanna talk uh, specifically about the pharmacists that I'm talking about. So I'm talking about pharmacists practicing in a community-based setting. So you'll often hear me refer to them as community pharmacists. And again, these are pharmacists who are either generalists or specialists uh, in the ambul ambulatory care setting, um, and they present in the communities they serve. So that's where we get the term community pharmacy. Um, so most of you are familiar with traditional community pharmacies. So we have our independent sort of mom and pop pharmacies, your chain, which is your CVS or your Walgreens, your mass merchant, Costco and Walmart, and your supermarkets such as Publix and Harris Teeter. But I also wanna say that the community pharmacy term also encompasses pharmacists that are in health systems in the community setting, um, FQHCs, as well as certain specialty clinics. Um, so I just wanted to make sure that we understand when I'm talking about community pharmacists, I'm talking about the pharmacists that present within the community. You can go to the next slide, Kate. So now let's look at why pharmacists are greatly positioned to assist with the opioid crisis. Um, it's, it's really self-explanatory that everybody knows that pharmacists are the medication uh, experts. And when we think about opioids as medication, it makes sense to involve pharmacists now with the opioid crisis, but really pharmacists are greatly positioned beyond their medication expertise. And it's really because of their convenience to the customers and need of a lot of these services. In fact, um, one study revealed that patients view, um, will see their pharmacist 35 times a year compared to their primary care physician, which is maybe four times a year. And so when we think about the services that pharmacies offer, um, they offer a wide range of services that extend beyond prevention and even treatment in today's current opioid crisis climate. And a lot of these services include evaluating patients and prescriptions to access for potential opioid misuse and abuse, establishing policies to monitor for patient risk of opioid misuse, recommending naloxone to mitigate the risk of fatal overdose, as well as educating on safe storage and disposal. And so these are the ones that we are going to talk about. But before we talk about those, I'd like to ask you, and you can go to the next slide. Have you collaborated with pharmacists to address the opioid crisis in your community? And so we're gonna have the poll come up, I believe, and you can just respond yes, no, or just let us know if you are a pharmacist. Gonna give it a few more seconds. Oh, 
All right, and can we close that poll to see what most people say? Are you able to see the results? I am not. Can you see them? <laughs> oh, wait. There we go. Okay. There, okay. So it looks like 20% uh, have said that they have collaborated with the pharmacist. 45% no. And no pharmacist. So it looks like I'm probably the only pharmacist today, which hopefully I'll be able to provide a lot of information. Uh, but those who said that they have collaborated with a pharmacist, do you mind unmuting yourself if possible? and let us know how you have collaborated with pharmacists in your community. Okay, you may have to make um, everyone panelist if you wanna do that, or if, if folks wanna raise their hand using that feature at the bottom of your screen, then we can unmute you that way as well. Or you can use the chat feature. Thank you, Taylor. You're welcome. Like Xavier is raising. There All right. Let's have see another. It. There you go. Oh, there we go. You are unmuted. Xavier, would you please share your experience? Me? Yes. Hey, yes. how y'all? Uh, how are y'all doing? Good. All right, to answer your question, uh, that's a good question. One way we have collaborated with our pharmacies um, in our county, uh, we have over 14 pharmacies in our county. Uh, that's, you know, based off the different cities that we have in our county. Uh, we collaborate with them uh, through county lock and drop it, uh, through drug take back events, uh, through um, health fairs. Uh, even we, we have uh, several pharmacies in our county that are on our coalition. So basically what they do is we want to understand the list when it comes to uh, prescribing. So that won't be, be, be doing any doctor shopping. Uh, so we work with them on that. Uh, we also award them for being active in the community. Uh, they allow us to come out front and uh, we, we've taken it to a whole nother level when it comes to distributing lock boxes for home use in our community. Uh, we found out that the best way to do it is to uh, request that the pharmacists allow us as a coalition to come on the parking lot. Uh, and once the uh, people receive their medication, just ask them if they want, uh, would have to have, like to have a lockbox. So what that has done is that has allowed the pharmacies in our county uh, because they receive funding too and grant money too, to also purchase lockboxes, which benefits not only uh, them and the coalition, but everybody in the community. Wow, Xavier, that's amazing. I, I might have to be uh, contacting you after this to uh, get some of your research resources, because it seems like you're partnering really well with the pharmacists um, in your area. It looks like someone else said that they have several pharmacies in their eight county region that have installed medication drop off boxes, and they also uh, provide them with prescription bags with our remove the risk initiative. So these are all great initiatives and we're going to talk a little bit about them a little later. But I'm happy to hear that a lot of you have already started the process of collaborating with your pharmacists, and if you haven't just yet, hopefully. Um, some of the conversations that we discussed today will inspire you to kind of reach out to your pharmacist and see how you can collaborate with them. All right, you can go to the first slide. I mean, next slide. So now let's look at naloxone dispensing. So I'm pretty sure a lot of you are familiar with naloxone, and this is the medicine that rapidly reverses an opioid overdose. Um, so you could think about how life saving naloxone is. And naloxone dispensing is one of the key role pharmacists play uh, in the intervention of the opioid crisis. Um, I have a date to the, um, on this slide that says of, as of December 31st, but I actually looked right before this. And so as of July 2022, all states, including the District of uh, Columbia and Puerto Rico, have some form of naloxone access law. So we can think about where we were um, three years ago to where we are now. We are seeing that all states do currently have some form of access um, laws. Now, the laws differ in whether or not those are understanding order, prescriptive authority, or a collaborative practice agreement. But it's great to know that anyone can access uh, naloxone in all of the 50 states. 
just to give you some more information, 33 states currently allow pharmacists to administer naloxone understanding orders, while 14 states allow pharmacists to enter into agreements with prescribers uh, at their own vol volition. So we call these collaborative practice agreements, if you're familiar with them. Uh, unfortunately, there's only two states, Oregon and Idaho, that uh, grant um, pharmacists full prescriptive authority, including um, naloxone dispensing. But what we mostly see in the pharmacy setting is the standing order. And so you can go to the next slide. And so here we have the pharmacist specific naloxone access laws for states across the Southeast. And as you can see, most of these states allow pharmacists to dispense under a standing order. And what a standing order means for the pharmacist is that they are allowed to dispense these medications without a prescription. I will say though, it is very important for you to kind of become familiar with your specific state laws as these are often um, changing as the opioid crisis progresses. And there's some, you know, specific terms in a lot of these standing orders that kind of restrict who pharmacists may or may not dispense to. Um, so I don't know if you've been familiar with looking at policies. It can get definitely a little tedious, but please become familiar with what the standing order reads um, in your specific state before um, deciding how pharmacists are able to assist in lay persons who might require naloxone. Next slide. So now we're gonna look specifically at what North Carolina um, has when it comes to naloxone. So here we have some research that basically surveyed naloxone dispensing across North Carolina, as well as pharmacists experiences with uh, attitudes in harm reduction services. And what we found was disp dispensing naloxone at least was occasionally reported in 88% of ph by pharmacists. With urban pharmacies dispensing naloxone more than rural pharmacies, and urban pharmacists' attitudes towards harm reduction services for persons who inject drugs uh, were a little more supportive than those of rural pharmacists' attitudes. This was also followed by research, you can go to the next slide, that showed that 61.7% um, of North Carolina retail pharmacists have naloxone available without a prescription, with chain pharmacies being more likely to have naloxone available than independent pharmacies. Um, pharmacies across North Carolina's list of pharmacies carry a lox that carry naloxone were more likely to have it, but we did see that naloxone availability was lower in communities with higher percentages of residents with public health um, insurance. And so what these two, two studies show is that while pharmacists are greatly positioned to assist with the opioid crisis via naloxone dispensing, barriers still do exist. However, we would discuss some of the work that is being done to assist with these barriers a little later, as well as share some ways that you can partner with community pharmacies to also overcome these barriers. Next slide. And so now we'll look at dispensing medications for opioid use disorder. So you'll hear me say MOUDs. Um, so these are medications such as buprenorphine, methadone, and naltrexone. I will say to date, buprenorphine products, including the buprenorphine naloxone um, combination medication, um, is the only opioid agonist treatment that is available to be dispensed in U.S. pharmacies. However, the caveat with that is that these prescriptions must come from a valid credential prescriber. So this is how dispensing of MOUDs presents in a community pharmacy setting. And as you can see, methadone can be um, uh, dispensed at a community pharmacy setting, but only for the treatment of pain, which we often do not see. Um, so thinking about buprenorphine products as being the only MOUD treatments that are available to be dispensed at the community pharmacy. You can go to the next slide. And so some of the roles that pharmacists have with dispensing buprenorphine in the community pharmacy setting including uh, includes increasing product uh, education and proper use, advocating for and supporting the removal or loosening of wholesaler medication limits, 
which we'll discuss a little later, as well as ensuring uh, connection to care in the community and a host of others that we'll talk about. Next slide. So buprenorphine products possess a number of great benefits in the community pharmacy setting. I would like to call out that in most insurance, insurance covers it. So you're thinking about Medicare, Medicaid, and many commercial payers will cover um, buprenorphine in a community pharmacy setting. It's accessible for patients who are not geographically located near opioid treatment um, programs. So thinking about the access to community pharmacies offers to these uh, communities as well as availability of the treatment option to those who do, who do not seek or wish to engage in methadone care due to their own stigma. So we think of the community pharmacy setting as providing a lot of benefits when it comes to buprenorphine for MOUD. Yet, buprenorphine treatment is highly regulated and it can only be prescribed by waiver practitioners, which I discussed previously. Uh, and also, we do know that pharmacists' attitudes and beliefs towards MOUD treatment may impede current and future implementation. Uh, and so, I'm now, now I'm just going to move on and talk a little bit about some of those barriers that we might see in the community pharmacy setting. So, what the research has shown us in North Carolina is that 96% of pharmacies keep buprenorphine in stock, which is really good. However, pharmacists who have more negative attitudes towards buprenorphine were less likely to dispense. And what we found is 62% refused to fill a buprenorphine prescription. Um, 55% of, of those pharmacies refused at least three times, with the most common reason being refusal for out-of-area um, patients. And so, again, we think about pharmacies being a place where access can occur for those patients in areas. But then pharmacists have an attitudes about patients who come to their pharmacy from other areas. I also like to just point out again, pharmacy type and characteristic does play a role in what um, these ordering limits are and what ordering limits are perceived. And I'll talk about that a little bit more, but we do start to see differences in pharmacist attitudes depending on whether or not we are in a rural, urban, or traditional or um a independent or a um, retail pharmacy. And lastly, 31% believe that there are buprenorphine order and limits. So we're gonna talk about those order and limits in the next slide. Uh, maybe it'll be the next slide after that, sorry. Uh, so before we talk about the order and limits, I do wanna say that there is another product Suboxone. So this is the buprenorphine and naloxone combination I was talking about. Uh, but this was another um, study that was done ac across 15 pharmacies in rural Western North Carolina, in which we did phone calls um, with different patient scenarios. And overall, we found a willingness to dismiss Suboxone um, in pharmacies, but the pharmacy staff contacted by sec secret shoppers were most likely to ex express reluctance to dispense to out-of-state patients, which I said previously. Uh, and pharmacy staff were most likely to exhibit signs of possible stigma and bias towards shoppers that asked about purchasing syringes prior to asking about fueling buprenorphine. So again, seeing a lot of the bias and stigma that still kind of presents in um, North Carolina community pharmacies. You can go to the next slide. Okay, so now here's where I was talking about, about these um, DEA wholesaler kind of um, law. So everyone knows that the mission of the DEA is to enforce controlled substance. Um, and so along with that mission, medication wholesalers kind of struggle to accurately understand and interpret regulatory guidelines. And though research has been able to find that no cap or policy exists when it comes to wholesaler purchase limits, Wholesaler, wholesale distributors do impose ordering thresholds on pharmacies in attempts to comply with some nebulous DA guideline. And as you can imagine, this has implications for medication availability that creates these buprenorphine bottlenecks. And so what we have are issues where pharmacists are unaware of this limit that is imposed on them and so while they are stocking buprenorphine, there's this fear 
that they might not be able to order any more in the next month to apply again with some nebulous DEA limits. And so that's why we often see pharmacists are a little hesitant to, again, dispense buprenorphine to out of state or out of area patients because there's this concern about what about the patients in my community and their access to buprenorphine. And so from this work and all that we've found, uh, we see that researchers and policymakers are really making recommendations for policy clarifications or changes to help facilitate distributor, uh, distributor interpretation. Um, and Kate will discuss this a little bit uh, later, but it is one of the barriers that we do see in the community pharmacy setting when it relates to buprenorphine access. And you can go to the next one. And I wanna say that even though, again, these barriers exist, there are a lot of people across the state of North Carolina that are doing the work to ensure that we can improve buprenorphine access in community pharmacies across the state. And so patient interviews, as well as pharmacy stakeholder interviews have been done to basically see what are some ways that we can help increase this access. And from the patient's end of things, we've seen that agreements between buprenorphine prescribing health departments and community pharmacies could help increase access to buprenorphine. We think about barriers to buprenorphine, uh, including costs um, and stigmatizing treatment by, uh, by pharmacists. So thinking about educating our pharmacists for that as well as there are some facilitators to buprenorphine access, including creating uh, dedicated dispensing agreements with prescribers and pharmacists in the area. And then again, for our pharmacists, um, they did ask for additional and consistent training for pharmacists and pharmacy staff on buprenorphine best practices. And then again, this need for this provider um, pharmacist sort of communication when it comes to dispensing buprenorphine to uh, out of area patients. You can go to the next slide. Um, go back one more. Okay, there we go. And so I talked about the two key um, services that we see, um, naloxone and MOUD uh, dispensing. These are very key in the current opioid crisis, but I do wanna say that pharmacists also have additional roles such as the prescription drug monitoring program. So these are the PDMP. And this is basically a service that collects information from the pharmacy, including what controlled substances are dispensed, how much, um, to whom, and by whom. And basically what this allows the pharmacist to do is to detect any inappropriate prescribing or monitor patients who are kind of, you know, doctor shopping for medication. So again, thinking about um, looking for a potential for opioid misuse and abuse. Pharmacists can also counsel on opioid risk and safety. So thinking about educating patients on the risk associated with opioid use, proper storage and disposal, which we'll get into a little later, and the consequences of sharing these meds with other people. And lastly, opioid deprescribing. Um, deprescribing just essentially refers to reducing the use of inappropriate medications, so thinking about patients who are on our opioid medications for an acute reason and thinking about how can we safely deprescribe them to prevent, um, again, further use of uh, um, further potential for opioid misuse and abuse. Next slide. So one additional role that we are really seeing pharmacists make an impact and the two people that actually talked about having collaborations talked about this a little bit. But um, pharmacists are really making an impact on educating on safe storage and disposal of a lot of these medications. So here we have two campaigns, one from the FDA and one from the CDC, um, that really um, teaches people how to properly store and dispose of their medications. And you can go to the next slide. And so research has shown that the provision of educational pamphlets by Medical providers do increase self-reported storage and or disposal of unused prescription opioids. However, 48 to 78 percent of people still do not dispose of their unused opioid medications. So this indicates um, additional intervention is warranted. And when we think about community pharmacists and the role that they can play in there, um, in that um, service, thinking about helping to uh, educate pharmacies on opioid storage and disposal. Next one. 
So some of the opportunities pharmacy have is providing med medication disposal boxes. So in 2014, there was a revision to the Secure and Responsible Drug Disposal Act, uh, which permitted pharmacies to collect unused medications. Thinking about deactivation products, so all Walgreens pharmacies that do not currently offer a safe medication disposal kiosk now offer dispose our X packets or other drug disposal options that are available upon request in the pharmacy at no cost. And all CVS pharmacy locations that do not currently have a safe medication disposal kiosk now offer dispose RX po uh, packets at no cost to patients filling an opioid prescription for the first time. So we think about pharmacies having an opportunity to provide safe disposal of these medications. Next slide. And so what we see across North Carolina, this was a study to identify pharmacies with disposal boxes in three different years. So in 2016, 2018, and 2021. And what we can see is there is an increase in disposal boxes over time. So in 2016, only 43 pharmacies, which is 1.7% when you think about it across the state, had disposal boxes. And this number increased to 144 in 2018 and now to three, uh, 350 in 2021, where we saw the implementation of disposal boxes. Go to the next one. And so what we are seeing is there is an increase in disposal boxes in pharmacies over time. Um, but unfortunately, 86.5% of pharmacies in North Carolina do not have a disposal box. So thinking about growth and chain pharmacies with disposal programs, and there were some um, minimal place disparities, such as disposal boxes being more likely to be in tracks with higher poverty and less likely to be in tracks with higher um, unemployment. Next slide, please. Um, but just to summarize again, pharmacists are greatly positioned to assist with the opioid crisis. We offer a number of services that expand across prevention and treatment. And now I'll turn it over to Kate, who's going to share with you a few ways that you can partner with your community pharmacies and also provide you with a few strategies to overcome some of the barriers that we discussed. Thank you, Tamara. That was an excellent overview. I still need to learn so much more about the buprenorphine access in pharmacies. Uh, it's really great. Um, so just a bit of context um, for the next section. So I am in academia, uh, but I've also worked with numerous substance use coalitions and substance use providers um, in, in their work uh, in their communities. So in opioids in North Carolina, some in alcohol and other states. I'm also part of our local substance use coalition and um, was actively involved in uh, obtaining funding for the Comprehensive Addiction and Recovery Act, the CARE grant. Um, and so the CARE grant was essentially a supplement of funds for DFC funded coalitions. Um, I'm not sure how many of you all might, might have that funding as well, um, but we really decided to focus on partnering with our local pharmacists um, and doing work on disposal uh, and storage education. Uh, so, we wrote our grant using the seven strategies, which will be the, the framing today. Um, so if you're not familiar with the seven strategies, uh, these, these are the strategies. So we have providing information, enhancing skills, providing support, enhancing access and reducing barriers, changing consequences, making physical changes and changing policies. But I'm gonna walk through um, several of these with examples, but I really see this as a time where we can all kind of connect and maybe brainstorm um, additional strategies um, within the seven strategies, uh, thinking about naloxone, buprenorphine, and then the disposal piece, and even some of the PDMP work um, if we feel that that's necessary. So when I designed the slides, I really did think that we might have some pharmacists on the call, um, but, but we don't. Uh, so I'll, I'll frame it more in how we can address as substance use providers. Um, but the idea is that you know it's a relationship that we have. Um, so there's three really stakeholders that I was thinking about in developing this. So we had the pharmacist, 
Um, we have the substance use prevention provider harm reduction group. Um, and then we have community members and patients. Um, and so, you know, really thinking about the demand um, of these services from community members influence what the pharmacist can or will do um, in conducting interviews with our local pharmacists. I found that a lot of patients, if they were offered naloxone as a co-prescription, turned it down um, for multiple reasons. So either they couldn't afford it, even if there was a small copay, um, but they really didn't feel like they needed it. Uh, so they didn't really see the need for naloxone if they were being prescribed opioids. So there, there's communication both with our pharmacists, um, but also with our community members um, and pharmacy patients uh, to think about how, how do we really maximize the pharmacist's role. Okay, without further ado, um, these are not ordered in a way that uh, they were presented or kind of the order in the social ecological model. Uh, but I wanted to start with enhancing access and reducing barriers. Um, and so the first thing to really do is identify what are the facilita facilitators and barriers for your local pharmacies to implement opioid harm prevention strategies. So I anticipate that this will vary based on everyone's unique communities, right? And the different pharmacies that they speak to um, and the pharmacists who are practicing that day. So the state, local, and organizational policies might look different um, in your different communities. And when I say organizational, I am referring to the pharmacy itself. Uh, so the corporate pharmacies might differ from what are, are more community or independent pharmacies. Um, and that could inhibit or facilitate the partnership that you can form. So when I spoke with many of the pharmacists at our local CBS or Walgreens, for the most part, um, they felt like they couldn't do much in their pharmacy with practicing with us uh, because of corporate policies versus the more independent regional community pharmacies uh, were more willing um, and open to working with us because they didn't have uh, the corporate overhead. So different pharmacists and pharmacies will have awareness of different policies and procedures. So some pharmacists might be um, more knowledgeable about, let's say, their Narcan or Naloxone standing order, um, and that they are able to prescribe or provide Naloxone without a prescription um, to individuals. So that's what we found in our study in North Carolina. And so identifying whether or not, um, is, is it awareness of your policy, or is it that they're just not willing to follow it for one reason or another? Availability in naloxone of buprenorphine. It was great to see so many North Carolina pharmacies had buprenorphine on stock. Um, in terms of availability in naloxone, that was one of the barriers that we found in North Carolina. So our smaller pharmacies just didn't have it in stock. So they would order it on, you know, on demand, um, but they just couldn't finance enough to have on hand. Um, Patient demand, so what does that look like in your community? Uh, are patients wanting to go to the pharmacy for these different services? Uh, we might have different levels of stigma for different pharmacists. Uh, and, and time itself is a huge barrier, Tamara. I'm sure you could speak to that uh, pharmacist time. So really seeing what are your you know, facilitators and barriers in your community. I see Georgiana is saying that um, they're seeing the same trend in availability as small non-commercial. Yeah. So feel free to chime in on any barriers or facilitators, um, but, but we acknowledge that this will be very community specific um, as to what, you, what you're seeing in your community. So I want to jump right into policies. So I'm a policy person. I like to see big change happening. Um, so might be familiar with the big P, little P model. Um, so essentially we have big policies, which would be more of those state and even unity policies that you have in place. Um, so some ideas for policies that you can advocate for 
Uh, so enable access to naloxone. So that was great, Tamara. So here that we had updated um, policies for naloxone access. I uh, clearly I I still feel confident that Florida was just prescribing to um, the emergency responders. If someone's from Florida and knows differently, please let us know. Um, but we pulled the actual standing order available online. So take a look at what your standing order um, is for your state and what does that really look like? Um, are there ways that you can improve it uh, and advocate for better policies to enable access to naloxone? Um, one, one barrier for the uh, collaborative practice agreements is that each pharmacist has to develop its own relationship with a prescriber. Um, so that makes it more challenging um, for pharmacists to uh, prescribe naloxone and more challenging for community members to know which pharmacies have naloxone available. Uh, so removal or loosening of wholesaler buprenorphine ordering limits by DEA. That, that seems like an ambitious um, goal, uh, but it, it's one, one aspect to do. I'm not sure if you're familiar with these policies on comprehensive disposal programs. I have a link in the slides here. Um, I'd be interested to know if any other communities or states have done this work. Um, essentially, Washington State has a policy that um, requires that the pharmaceutical companies pay for the disposal programs. Um, and so King County, where Seattle um, is located, passed this policy many years ago. There was a fight uh, with the pharmaceutical industry, um, but essentially they must have won because Washington now has a statewide policy for comprehensive disposal programs, uh, which I think is great because a large barrier for the independent pharmacies uh, that we tried to purchase a disposal box for, um, they just didn't feel like they had the funding to sustain um, the maintenance of the box. So feel free to chime in with more ideas. These are just some examples when we think about how we can structure the work that we do um, in our communities along with our pharmacies. So reminder, little policies are little peas. Um, this might be more organizational policy. So thinking about what can a pharmacist or pharmacy do um, on their in their own location. And so I anticipate that this will have a little more traction um, with the independent pharmacies. Um, yeah, so Mark asked, uh, does it help to have a local pharmacist on your coalition or board? And I would say yes, it does. Um, this is definitely a place where having buy-in um, from a pharmacist is incredibly important. Uh, we have, we're part of an academic community with an academic school medicine and pharmacy. So I work with our um, pharmacists at ACU. Uh, I would not want to do this webinar without Tamara here <laughs> um, leading the way as a, a pharmacist practice. Um, practice, or so even having friends um, in your community that might be uh, in the pharmacy. So turning back to the organizational policy for pharmacies, um, so the naloxone provision and adherence with state policy, so thinking about procedures that can take place within the pharmacy to ensure that if someone comes to ask for Narcan, um, without a prescription, if that's in alignment with the state, um, that that medication, that naloxone is provided to them. Um, agreements between buprenorphine prescribing, health departments and community pharmacies. Uh, provide disposal options to community members. So making a policy that um, you are either gonna have a disposal box or uh, provide something like deter or a disposer X I'm curious how many people knew that um, Walgreens or CVS uh, were willing to provide Dispose RX with an opioid uh, prescription if they didn't have a disposal box. If anyone has had that experience or knows someone that has, I would love to hear that from you. I, I found that on their websites and it was the first that, and like small print, right? 
Um, it was the first time I had heard that Walgreens or CVS would give out Dispose RX for free. <laughs> yeah, I did not either. Um, these are examples of some more organizational policies. Once again, as a substance use provider, you can't shouldn't go into your local pharmacy and say, I want these changes to occur, right? Um, it's building the pharmacist on your coalition board um, in your organization, getting that buy-in and talking to them to learn about what's what's going on in your practice and clinic and how how can we help facilitate any change. So thinking about how you can facilitate and um, make change within your pharmacy. So this is really how we approached it. Um, Georgiana, so do they have it? So she asked, do they, and I think this is Walgreens CBS, have the Disposer X or do coalitions provide it to them for distribution? Um, so I found on their website that they said they would provide it um, to individuals if they don't have a disposal box. This, I found this when I was developing this uh, webinar. Um, I know of different, maybe more independent pharmacies that might distribute Deterra packages or Disposer X if partnering with someone. Um, so Kelly um, is sharing that experience. Yeah, so uh, coalition organizations have worked with pharmacists to um, distribute Deterra and Disposer X. But according to the CVS and Walgreens website, they said that they would provide it. So um, I don't have an opioid prescription active. If anyone does, I know someone that does. Um, you might want to follow up with them and see if they've received uh, Disposer X. So one thing that I find um, that our independent pharmacies are more willing to do uh, so far is to put up signage that we provide to them. Um, and so here are some different examples. So I have found several CVSs, um, Walmart have signage, signage within their um, pharmacies. So this is not the case at all our pharmacies. We did um, an environmental assessment of all the pharmacies in our county to see um, what they currently have out there. And there's some signage on naloxone. Um, we have a take back your meds signage uh, behind this check in for your vaccination. Um, and in North Carolina, we have a statewide communication campaign campaign regarding locking your meds. And so we worked with our local independent pharmacies and some of them have agreed to put up signs. We even had one pharmacist at either CVS or Walgreens. I can't recall. I'm also not going to uh, disclose their information, but that pharmacist basically said, give us your, your materials. I'll put them up and ask for forgiveness later if the regional management comes in and is upset that I put up a sign. Um, so just because it might be easier to work with your independent pharmacist doesn't mean that your corporate pharmacists aren't going to work with you in your community. As part of our CARA funding, um, we budgeted to purchase some disposal boxes for our pharmacies that did not have them already. Um, we're still waiting on uh, some uptake on that piece, um, but you can see this is a disposal box um, from that was uh, in our uh, EC Physicians Pharmacy. So then enhancing skills, uh, so there are opportunities for local pharmacists to receive continuing education on naloxone, buprenorphine, and other patient education and workshops related to stigma reduction. So even thinking about these being offered maybe at the state level from your pharmacy board um, and other medical organizations, and maybe just providing that information that these uh, opportunities exist um, to your local pharmacies. So you know, I've offered myself to our local pharmacies and said, you know, this is the work that we're doing as part of our coalition. This is what we do all the time. You have my contact information. Please feel free to reach out at any point if you need additional information um, that's coming from the state or other other locations because you're very busy and you're doing other work. So changing consequences. Um, many of y'all are probably familiar with this approach and this strategy. 
Um, so promoting pharmacies that are doing good work um, in terms of opioid uh, use prevention. Um, so probably give me going for another 30 minutes talking about how um, the medication disposal program websites just aren't user friendly um, from the DEA and other locations. So what we did was that we created our own website um, on our coalition that we had verified locations um, that are taking back medications with a disposal box. Um, so we highlight these pharmacies that are doing this work. Uh, the state of North Carolina also has um, a website where pharmacists and pharmacies that are participating in the statewide standing order can register with the website for free and just have that available. If someone were to search online, they would find where they can get naloxone at a pharmacy. Um, co-located to them. And so providing information, um, once again, this is a relationship. So a pharmacist will provide information to you, ask them for what, what they're currently doing um, within their practice, what's within their scope in this state, um, provide information to them with what you know, maybe other communities or states or pharmacies are doing, share information that you've learned um, on this webinar. Really communicating with community members and patients so they know that they can get naloxone at a pharmacy if they need to. I really see this as an opportunity for parents who have children that might be at risk. Um, and that, that's really anyone's child at this point, right? We never we don't know what's going on. Um, and so these are individuals who might not be willing or even know where a harm reduction program is that's distributing Narcan. Um, and so having that knowledge that you can go to your local pharmacy and access naloxone is really huge um, and being willing to uh, take that medication when offered uh, to them. So those are just kind of examples. It certainly wasn't comprehensive. If anyone wants to add anything, please Please do. We have a Q and A time as well, um, and I've harped on this on different slides, right? So community awareness and demand. So doing an assessment to see which community members know that these services even exist um, at the local pharmacies. Uh, being mindful that um, maybe there'll be disparities in which community members are willing to go uh, to the different pharmacies uh, to access these services. Um, how do we communicate with our community members so they know that these are available to them? Um, and really thinking about that stigma reduction piece. You know, the pharmacist is there for everything from Halloween candy uh, to all your other medication needs. Um, and so this is a great place to access healthcare. All right, so with that, I will turn that back over to Taylor, I believe. Yes, thank you, Kate and um, Tamara. So before um, we we start the the Q and A, I just want to remind everyone, and I think Olivia did as well in the chat, um, that at the end of this webinar, please take a moment to complete our survey, um, and you can do that by scanning the QR code shown above, or once you exit out of the webinar, you will be directed. Um, to take our survey and to get your certificate of attendance as well. Um, so either way, but I am going to turn it over um, to Mark and Kate and uh, Tamara, and we can facilitate some Q and A. Thanks, Taylor. And yeah, if people can fill out the survey, that would be great. Uh, but please stay on if you can. Well, that was amazing, uh, Dr. Hughes and Dr. Egan. And uh, uh, I know there are a lot of questions, but uh, before we get to them, I'd like to first off uh, make a little proposal and then second ask a question just to get things started. Uh, so the proposal is just um, thinking about how to there was so much information that's been provided and um, you know people can only absorb so much. I know um, it was, I've learned a, a tremendous amount just listening to the two of you. Uh, so, you know, one thing that might people might find useful would be if we could continue our engagement with you and, and the PTTC and develop a, a product, a one or two page sort of distillation of 
um, you know, key things people should know. Um, and, and even, you know, perhaps, um, you know, uh, provide, uh, you know, consultation services that we could help broker th um, through the, uh, through our PTTC. Uh, so let me start with that and just get any reactions you might have to uh, our partnering on something along those lines. Is that a question for us or for yeah. uh, community well, it, demand? <laughs> That's a good point, Kate. It's uh, a question for you, but if people could put in the chat, uh, just what you know, if you have a level of interest, either in uh, an informational piece on our web on our website, like a one or two page, um, you know, kind of uh, backgrounder or in infographic, or uh, you know, potential uh, consultation services. But while people are filling that in, if uh, the two of you could um, give your thoughts on uh, on doing something along those lines. I'd be happy to assist with additional information. Me too. Excellent. Well, let me ask a question. Uh, so my question is, you know, we hear about the different waves of the opioid epidemic, the first wave, second wave, third wave, you know, some people are talking about the fourth wave now. And it seems not like we've developed some really good tools for, uh, you know, trying to address uh, prescribing uh, and the uh, imp the implications, the sort of sequelae of prescribing um, opioid analgesics. Um, but you know, people now are talking uh, for the past year or two or three about you know the third wave of the epidemic and um, you know fentanyl and other illicit uh, synthetics um, and even a, a possible fourth wave involving combination of stimulants and, uh, and opioids. And I just wonder, you know, as, as the epidemic evolves, uh, are there roles for uh, pharmacy and for uh, pharmacy community collaborations? Any thoughts on that? Well, I'll definitely chime in on the pharmacist role. There's definitely roles for pharmacists to help with all waves. Again, I, I look at pharmacists as not only the medication experts, so it makes sense for them to be involved. But again, thinking about access, I will say that there are barriers that are present in the pharmacy that are making um, how they show up in a lot of these roles kind of um, difficult. Um, when we think about, I remember I was working with a lot of pharmacies in the area prior to uh, COVID hitting. And we were working specifically on opioid stewardship. How can we educate pa uh, patients on their risk, educating them on um, illicit fentanyl and how it was showing up and then COVID hit. And so I will say again, pharmacies are greatly positioned given their access, but right now we have to do, we have to think about burnout and the, um, the many roles that pharmacists have within their community. And so that's why I think it's important for me as a pharmacist and researcher to find ways that we can help pharmacists with their workflow and overcome some of these barriers that are present because we do see that pharmacists are juggling many pandemics at once. And so thinking about how can we use them without overextending them. So that is one thing that we are trying to figure out. Again, it's no doubt pharmacists are there, pharmacists are willing to help, but we do also need a little help when it comes to, again, juggling two pandemics right now and trying to assist everyone. Thank you. Yeah, you know, I think about it a bit from how do we do this work uh, with the changing opioid climate, um, but still wearing our primary prevention hats. Um, so if we're receiving primary prevention funding, we typically need to focus on um, delaying initiation, reducing misuse among an adolescent young adult population. Um, and so we can work with the pharmacy and thinking about how can we prevent um, opi prescribed opioids from getting in the hands of youth, but also thinking about using that as leverage to also partner with them in, in that naloxone uh, dispensing into families. Um, so I'm a belief that we probably should all have naloxone on hand. Um, at some point, we're seeing fentanyl being laced in different substances, so even cannabis, um, and just knowing how youth use substances, uh, just always, always being prepared. So I think 
reframing how we're thinking about doing our primary prevention work and including the pharmacists as well. Great point. Thank you, Kate. Uh, well, let's open it up. Uh, I um, Let me hand off to Olivia. I think just by virtue of uh, being uh, really engaged in the chat, uh, Callie Bauer might be someone we could call on first. Uh, she's had a number of, uh, this, that individual's had a number of questions, but uh, uh, Olivia, why don't I hand over the reins to, to you and uh, Taylor? Yeah, we did have one question, or I think it was more of a comment that we were gonna um, come back to during Q and A. So I'll go ahead and read that off. And then if you have any more, just raise your hand or um, go ahead and put it in the chat. Um, so that one I was talking about, the person said, North Dakota has an opioid risk assessment tool called 1RX that participating pharmacists can use to determine if a patient could benefit from naloxone along with home medication disposal tools, such as Dystera. The challenge we face is getting pharmacists to participate in utilizing these tools, however. So I wonder if this comes kind of back to what Tamara was saying about their efforts being spread all over the place. But I will, you know, give that over to Tamara to comment. Yeah, um, I, when I saw Callie's comment, I, I fully believed it. Um, Callie, I would like for you to tell me again, um, if you can give me a little bit more information on the type of pharmacies. Again, thinking about what Kate brought up about how chains are a little restricted to the things that they can do given certain um, policies that their store might have. Um, it's very interesting because I know I presented some information that showed that independent pharmacies or your mom and pop pharmacies are uh, more uh, likely to hold certain uh, bias and stigma regarding um, the current opioid crisis. But I will say that it's sometimes also a little easier to partner with them when you are trying to do new services. Again, they don't have to um, go through uh, COVID uh, corporate loopholes to kind of approve new uh, interventions. So I'd just like to hear a little bit more about the type of pharmacies um, but again, just understand that this all kind of boils down to uh, maybe stigma and bias. And so that's why we're trying to do a lot to educate our pharmacists on the current opioid crisis, helping them understand that they do have a role in making sure that everyone has access to these medications and um, disposals. I see. So you said that these are local independent pharmacies. So the comment makes perfect sense that these pharmacies have quite a bit on their plate. It might not have time dedicating their um, staff and implementing new procedures. Exactly. And I'm not um, sure. I'll give you my contact information at the um, end of this. Um, but I am aware of the Community Pharmacy Enhanced Service Network. I'll have to double check if there are some pharmacies in North Dakota. But across the nation, there is a group of community pharmacies that are um, basically committed to providing enhanced services, and they are also committed to trying new services in their community pharmacy. A lot of these are independent pharmacies. We do have some, um, um, I do, I believe we have some grosser uh, pharmacies, such if you have a Kroger in the area that might be on that list. But oftentimes, it's finding those pharmacies who are willing to give you a chance. And if you can just find one pharmacy that says, yes, I'll do it, they're going to go to the next pharmacy conference and they're going to tell the pharmacy that they know, hey, I partnered with this local community member. They helped my patients so much, I didn't even know. And it becomes word of mouth. Again, thinking about how the community can help educate pharmacists. Um, and I think that that's one of the best ways. So again, we can just partner after this conversation. And I'll look to see what pharmacies are in your area and maybe we can start targeting some of those pharmacies who are used to implementing new services. One thing we've done too for, um, we're working with a, our local pharmacy um, for recruiting for a research study, but same idea, um, we bought Panera, we coordinated with the um, head of the pharmacy and they took shifts and we did short trainings and got their feedback and how can, what resources can we provide to help trigger when you have someone that's getting an opioid prescription that you also give them this flyer. Um, so it might just be a simple act of being so busy that they don't have a system in place where um, they remember that they have to provide this service. So even having a flag um, in their computer system when they have a prescription that comes through and says, make sure you do this, or even a sign in the office thinking about uh, changing the physical environment in the pharmacy from the pharmacy perspective. 
Thanks so much, y'all. So I'm looking to make sure there's no hands raised and I don't see any. So Mark, I know you said you had another question. So would you like to go ahead and ask your question? Sure, thank you, Olivia. Um, yeah, this is really for Dr. Hughes. And, um, you know, I think, I think we fall into a trap sometimes in community prevention work of believing people with particular roles should do something because we think it's the right thing to do. And it may be from our vantage point, but that doesn't really involve engaging them in a meaningful way. And the reality is that people have many interests, right? So a pharmacist is a healthcare professional. And so of course they're interested in community health, but they also have issues of you know, profitability, of time, of training, of you know, various limitations or, or constraints or challenges. And so I wonder if you have advice about how to enter into that conversation. You know, I specifically think about something uh, Kate and I worked on uh, in some of the projects we worked on when she was at Wake Forest, which is a community organizing approach, which in a way is just a fancy word for trying to understand someone's self-interest and start by having a conversation with that person about their reality, their contingencies, their, you know, what's important to them, what their constraints are. Um, so I, I would love to get any thoughts you have on sort of how to, how to start that relationship with your local pharmacist. Yeah, um, I will definitely say I've never had anyone ask me that question. So it's very interesting because in my work, I always think of it from the pharmacist lens of how can I partner with the community more <laughs> as a, a, a community pharmacist. Um, so I will say, and again, consider me as a very junior researcher, just starting out in the field. I'm just getting in um, into a lot of these conversations with community pharmacists. But I will say a lot of pharmacists want to help again. And so I think it, it's, it's just that starting the conversation. Um, again, I'm pretty sure that you're going to encounter some pharmacists that have probably been at the store for probably 20 years. You know, they're on their way out. They're not thinking about that thing. But when we think about, you know, our new graduates, they are learning a lot about the importance in their role in public health and being public health providers and advocates. And so I think it really is just starting that conversation. But what I'll do is as I continue my work and I talk a little bit more to pharmacists and ask them on ways that they would like the community to come to them and partner, I'll get back to you. But I, I really think it's just that starting the conversation and understanding that the pharmacists want to do so much more than um, what they're doing now. And oftentimes people just overlook them. When we think about our healthcare system as a whole, pharmacists are just, it's, it's amazing how overlooked we are. Uh, and just reaching out to your pharmacy. If you go to a pharmacy for any medications, you know how personal your pharmacist is with you and the rapport that they build. So I think it's just starting that conversation. Great, perfect, thank you. All right, taking a look at chat and hand raise. Looks like we have a hand raise from Xavier. So I'm going to unmute you, Xavier. Uh, good afternoon. Y'all can hear me, right? Yes. yes. Okay. Yes, I, I just wanted to kind of just um, um, echo what Ms. Hughes has said uh, from the engagement piece. Um, uh, as she said, it's so true. Uh, the pharmacists want to engage with the community, but I think that there is a stigma when it comes to pharmacy and community and understanding the total makeup of them being a part of the 12 sectors in our community and then us being visibility and partnering with them uh, to see what they offer to assist us and how we can assist them. And, and the ways we do that is we, uh, we, give, we give praise and then we give uh, a reward. Uh, when the uh, pharmacists in our area participate in the coalition activities, uh, anything they do, uh, we, we give them praise. We give it through social media, we give it through our local newspaper, we give it through awards. Uh, and we extend the invitation for them to come and speak at our coalition members. And we all know everybody on the call, I see the head shaking that what that does is that brings about a form of participation and oneness because the biggest obstacle we face, I heard Ms. Hughes say something about uh, the pharmacists that have been in existence for 20 years. I'm in a rural county. 
where they have been in existence for 50 and, and 60 years, you know, and, 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 you know, they're starting to come in more with, with younger pharmacies and, but they're dealing with the public who, you know, who are dealing with prescriptions. And then we want to make it a competition too. We don't want to take the, uh, the clients or the, uh, or the people that are coming receiving medications, you know, from the pharmacies. I mean, that's the list, but we want to find a way to engage them as well. So one of the ways we do that is uh, I serve as a county commissioner in my county. So a lot of the pharmacies are county commissioners in their district. So that gives us an excellent way to partnership and get the information out there to bring about a competition. So what the, what that does is we praise them, we give them a certificate, we encourage them and, and get them engaged. And then we incorporate the parents to come and understand what, what the pharmacy do. Uh, doctor shopping is a crime in, in, Spain, in Spanish and English and all of our pharmacy. I mean, I think that uh, I heard everything that was said, but from an engagement piece, I think that we're going to have to find a way to partnership, uh, uh, understand the login process so people won't be getting medication, you know, or going one place and then they don't get in going through another one. Our pharmacists explain it to the coalition members and you'll be amazed at how many people in the community never heard that. So now they're getting an understanding of how people get medication illegally or steal medication. So you lock it up or you take it to the lock, the lockbox location in the county. We have a digital billboard uh, that's telling. Uh, you know, where the local pharmacy, uh, I mean, the local lockbox permanent uh, for disposal is located. We wanted to get away from the paper billboard because we found out people didn't look at it. But, you know, when you have something big and bright and lights, you know, people can see it. And uh, one of the things with the Knox alone, we, we, we're working with the state now and we're trying to tell the state the signs are too small. You know, uh, just for example, if I'm, a, I'm, I'm somebody who's, a, who's a, about to overdose, and it's three o'clock in the morning and I'm riding down the street and, and, and you know, I'm about to overdose and then I, 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 see, I can't see the sign because it's dark. I, I'm, I'm more unlikely to try to get a resource to help me. But if I have it in a big lime green ultraviolet color when my lights hit it, I think that will draw more attention to me seeking the help right then. So I, I just think that in community engagement, uh, involving everybody in it, uh, and, and I'm going to end it with this. Our biggest challenge, you never guess who it was in our county, was Walmart. <laughs> and now Walmart brings every old medication and they bring old, outdated medication to our drop box. At our last drug take back, Walmart bought in excess of 250 pounds that they were disposing. But if we didn't engage now, we never would have knew that. So we partnership and we, we're visible. We're in the parking lot handing out lock boxes to customers that come out, uh, you know, that feel their medication on proper disposal. Uh, uh, our coalition, our number, our red line number, knock song, you know, all of that is in that box. We're teaching them also how to use it. So what does that do? That builds a coalition, that builds the pharmacies, that builds the community, and it gets it out there. Thank you so much. That that's amazing how you partner with pharmacies in the area. And it has me fired up as a pharmacist um, to go seek some of those pharmacies that are ready to partner with the community. Yeah, because I was shocked when you put the uh, the information up there, have you partnership? And I looked and I said, man, anybody only one? You know, because <laughs> I think that it's important that, uh, you know, we uh, partnership with them to get the information out to the citizens. And I think that will be the biggest reduction. Partnership and alone can bring about a a 50% in reduction in what you do, you know, I think partnership is a big, no big eyes, no little U's, you know, I think that brings about a significant reduction. Yes. I'm through. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, well, you so Thank you so much. Fantastic. Uh, that was a really great contribution, Xavier. Thank you. Well, uh, are there any other questions left in the chat? I'm looking and I'm looking to see if we have any other hands raised. It looks like we don't. So I think we're ready to wrap it up. Well, fantastic. Well, uh, thank you both Dr. Egan and Dr. Hughes. This was a, a remarkable uh, webinar. Thank you to all the participants. Uh, maybe we can um, do a round of virtual thanks and uh, applause for uh, our, uh, our uh, terrific speakers today. Uh, and uh, we'll follow up. We'll follow up with, um, uh, as was mentioned in the chat, posting uh, within a few days the um, uh, the presentation, uh, a recording, 
and uh, also, um, you know, we'll work on, um, you know, partnering with our great speakers today on uh, providing uh, products and uh, consultation for you all. So uh, thanks and have a great day. And, uh, and Taylor or Olivia, do you want to put in one last plea for uh, filling out the, um, the GIPRA survey? And then we can let people on their way. Yeah. So please take a moment to complete our um, survey. Um, you can either scan the QR code that's on the screen now, um, or once you leave this webinar, it should automatically direct you to take our um, survey. It will be an external link, so don't be scared. Just click on it, um, take it, and you also get your certificate of attendance that way as well. So please, please, it helps us um, make our webinars better for the future and um, just gives us a good idea of, of what we're doing good and ways to improve. So please take a moment to do that. Thank you all. Mark, did you mean to raise your hand? No, 